For us, here's Harris. The news never stops indeed. A war of words now over what the president is reported to have said during an immigration private meeting, and it's rocking Washington. Let's go over time. I'm Harris Faulkner. President Trump is pushing back, denying reports that he used a vulgar expression when describing immigrants from certain countries. During talks over the immigration impasse gripping Washington, D.C., the president tweeted this. The language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made a big setback for DACA. And later tweeted this, never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Country. Never said take them out, made up by dims. I have a wonderful relationship with Haitians, probably should record future meetings, unfortunately, no trust. But a Democratic senator who was at that meeting has a sharply different account from the president's. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live with the news. John? Harris, good afternoon to you. This appears to be the shot or the, you know, the word heard round the world. Uh, certainly the president is hearing a lot from world leaders, politicians here in his own country about what he said yesterday. The president just completed an event in the Roosevelt Room, signing the annual proclamation declaring Monday to be Martin Luther King uh, Day, also announcing that the Martin Luther King historic site there in Atlanta is going to be expanded into a national park. But the president refusing to answer shouted questions about his comments in the Oval Office yesterday about why are we taking people from blank hole countries. Listen here. Mr. President, will you give an apology for the statement yesterday? Mr. President, did you refer to African Asians? Mr. President, are you a racist? Mr. President, will you respond to these serious questions about the statement, sir? No, Mr. President, I'm talking to the President. Mr. President, are you a racist? And the president exiting the Roosevelt Room without commenting. Similarly, participants in the event who came out to the driveway to speak with the press after the event refused to answer questions about the president's remarks. Harris, you pointed out that the president tweeted this morning that he denies ever saying that. And earlier, the White House Director of Strategic Communications, Mercedes Schlapp, stuck with the president's position. Listen here. That language was not used. Well, do, do I, I was not in the room. I was not in the room, and it was very clear that he, in his tweet, is his tweet stands, which was the language was not used. But Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, who was in the Oval Office yesterday, was invited up along with Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, definitely says he heard what he heard, and here's what he says he heard. Listen here. He said, Haitians, do we need more Haitians? And then he went on and we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments, calling the nations they come from the exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. On the larger issue, and that is what to do about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, which is what that meeting was about, it looks like they've still got a long way to go. The president tweeting that the deal that was brought to him by Senators Graham, Durbin, and Flake was nowhere near good enough. The president writing, quote, the so-called bipartisan DACA deal presented yesterday to myself and a group of Republican senators and congressmen was a big step backwards. Wall was not properly funded. Chain and lottery were made worse, and USA would be forced to take large numbers of people from high-crime countries which are doing badly. I want a merit-based system of immigration and people who will help take our country to the next level. I want safety and security for our people. I want to stop the massive inflow of drugs. I want to fund our military, not do a damn defund. The President Harris arrived uh, just a few minutes ago at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, after motorcading up there to have his first annual physical. It's scheduled to last for about three hours' time, after which he'll uh, head down to Andrews Air Force Base and head down to Mar-a-Lago. We will get the results of that physical presented to us on Tuesday. So something to look forward to next week, Harris. Well, and one other thing that we didn't mention is the fact that we had it live just a few minutes ago on outnumbered speaker, uh, House Speaker Paul Ryan also got on board mm -hmm. and called the remarks unfortunate. So as you kind of, you know, encircle whether or not this was said and how it was put and how it possibly got repeated from a private meeting, uh, you, you can add those to the facts as well, the president uh, yeah, being spoken and, about by the House Speaker. And, and, and one other thing, Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina confirms that Lindsey Graham told him that's what the president 
president said, so there's another confirmation. All right, we'll move on, John Roberts. So how could all of this impact the delicate immigration negotiations going on right now? Because that's the, the higher conversation that has to be had immediately. Let's bring in Republican Senator Bill Cassidy of the great state of Louisiana. Great to see you this morning. Thank you very Thanks much for, for being me. with us. Uh, so you heard me just mentioning that the House Speaker has already then stepped up and, and said what he said about these remarks. I want to get your take on it. I thought what you just said was perfect. The president's denying he said it, whether he said it or not, that's not the issue. What about the higher problem of what do we do about border security and DACA? What will be tragic in all this is as Washington kind of gets a titter and a Twitter about what the president did or did not say, we will not focus on border security and doing something for DACA. I'm a doctor. I know that sometimes when there is a major problem, you put your blinders on, you focus on that problem, and you drown out other distractions. This is a distraction. You pegged it. It's the higher problem. Let's go after that. All right. We are just getting word now uh, from a couple of people, others who were in the room, uh, Republicans, and I, I want to look through that, Senator uh, Perdue and Senator Cotton saying, um, we do not recall the president saying those comments specifically, but what he did call out was the imbalance in our current immigration system. And that brings us back to this, this higher elevated conversation that we have to have on Capitol Hill about going forward. And it would be nice to have it uh, as you're also discussing how we're going to keep the government open. How much of a distraction is this? Well, clearly it's a distraction because the press is allowing Democrats to not defend augmenting border security, which previously they have been in favor of, have previously voted for, um, and, and, there, and we're, we're talking about what may or may not have been said, as opposed to, wait right. a second, the president's offering a deal. Border security, we take care of DACA. You've previously voted for the border security provisions that are before us, and now you say you don't want them. You're moving the goalpost. That's the bigger issue. That's the more important public policy for both the border security and the DACA kids. I described it as a delicate situation. You said I did a good job by describing it that way, because it is. I mean, we saw something that we, it was remarkable, that 55-minute live meeting that the, the president let the camera stay in far longer than the usual thing, which is just like a little photo op, a spray at the top. I, and we saw a movement there about tone and hopefulness, Senator Cassidy. And I'm wondering if you can get back to that and if you can do so expeditiously. Only if you just stay laser focused. It is about border security. It is about DACA. It's about keeping illegal drugs and illegal immigrants on the other side of the border and taking care of the DACA kids. If Democrats really care about DACA, they will also focus on the deal before us. Will, we, will they give up more border security, which previously they have supported? Uh, if we can stay focused on that, I would argue that's the more important thing to focus on, not what was or was not said in a meeting. The president is said to have uh, made those remarks, whether he did or did not the way that it's being reported right now. He, he denies so. Um, but he's said to have been very angry because the Senate bill did not come close to what he wanted, and he listed some things. What are your thoughts about that? Chain migration being on the list. He didn't think that that was dealt with in a way that was effective. Yeah, a chain migration is clearly important. Again, border security, taking care of the kids with DACA, all of those are important. You want to avoid getting the deal too comprehensive because mm -hmm. then there's too much to oppose. But if you can stay laser focused on the four pillars, if you will, then you can actually come to common ground. I think you can because, again, uh -huh. Democrats supported almost all these things that Republicans are now proposing, um, and they would get DACA. So mm -hmm. I think it's actually a good place to be stay laser focused. Yeah, that's interesting because when you look at the House version that was put together by Chairman Goodlatt and uh, McCall, McSally and Labrador, they, they have broken it out in four areas as well. So, I mean, if Republicans can kind of get together on this, maybe you can attract some Democrats. Real quickly, I want to ask you about something. You know, for reporters, we have a term it's called off the record. That's a little bit different than walking into a private meeting. But I have to think, Senator, and certainly going back and forth with you, um, there's an etiquette there's an honor in meeting privately and not discussing what was talked about. And while those things may be incendiary, I want to get your take on that. 
I totally agree with you. It undermines trust going forward. Whatever was or was not said, if you disagree with what the fellow or, or gal says, then you, you, you disagree with them publicly then. But to go out and kind of uh, report it is going to undermine trust, not just for this issue, but for future issues. It's just a rule of human contact, whether it's a marriage, a friendship, uh -huh. or a political negotiation. Oh, you like to break it down and bring it back to the real world, off the hill, with those examples. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Senator Cassidy. Thank you. Well, for more on how the White House next should handle the controversy and what it could mean actually for the president as he goes into the weekend now uh, and comes out on the other side having to get a deal on keeping the government open, um, what about his base in terms of the midterm elections too? So more to talk about here. Let's bring in former White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer. Great day to have you along. Your time matches my dress. Thank you. We'll move on. Uh, what should... <laughs> Thank you. I got a smile. What should the White House do? They can't dodge this. They got to take this. So what do they do? Well, all you can do is say what the president said. And you have to reframe the issue as the way the president did it. And I think you have to bring it back then to the fundamentals of the agreement they're trying to get and work toward the agreement and try to blip through what the president said. That will only work for about one minute of the briefing. And the rest of the briefing will be the press banging on the president. You saw the end of the MLK proclamation and, and reporters shouting things out, repeating the, the bad yeah. language that purportedly was used in the meeting. How much does it help uh, to have uh, Purdue and others come out and say, we didn't remember hearing it that way, but this was the discussion? You know, Harris, I'm a little more focused on what does this mean and, and what does it mean for the president and for getting an agreement to build the wall, to change immigration and to protect the dreamers, which is what I would like to see happen all the above. And here's my, my take on it. You know, Donald Trump is probably the only person who can get an immigration agreement. His predecessors couldn't. He could. It was like Nixon going to China. Along Trump's way to China, he took a detour in the meeting yesterday with the language he used, regardless what context he used, whether it was about Haiti or Africa. I just don't think it's helpful to getting agreements for presidents to talk like that. You know, I'm all for blunt talk. I'm all for direct talk. And the president has changed the system mm -hmm. with his politically incorrect talk, often to the better. But remember when Barack Obama called the Boston Police Department stupid? You know, he spoke in plain English, but he shouldn't have said it. Here, I think it's similar. Donald Trump spoke in plain English, but he shouldn't have said it. It's not helpful to diplomacy. It's not helpful to getting agreements done. All right, so you are a messaging genius in terms of writing what happens next for a White House. What would you suggest, what would you advise in terms of the wording that the president uses? Does it come with an apology to anyone? Should it? Well, number one, if I'm Donald Trump, I, I start tweeting about what Nancy Pelosi said today about crumbs is all that the uh, working people are getting by getting a $1,000 and $2,000 bonuses. Uh, they should make Nancy Pelosi's statement the biggest issue they can possibly fight over if, if they can. That won't work at the press briefing because the press would rather go after Donald Trump than Nancy sure. Pelosi. But then, two, bring it back to the substance of the agreement and talking about how at the end of the day you still have to get something done. And what Donald Trump wants to do is build a wall. The Democrats refuse to compromise on building a wall. The president wants to change our immigration system. So it's merit-based. That's in the most Americans mm -hmm. support. That's where you have to focus. Today's the day for the White House to try to focus on substance, while the press will focus entirely on process, but deservedly so. This is what happens if presidents say things that cross a line and go too far. Yeah. Did, did he miss an opportunity at the MLK proclamation to move this forward? No, I don't think there's anything the president could have done or said at that. So no that apology event, you think is necessary? Especially since he's sticking to what he said. That's, Donald Trump wouldn't anyway. Um, but what I regret the most, Harris, is there's so much good going on. The yeah. bonuses are making profound lo impacts and improvements in the lives companies, of people. 100 companies, 80 to 100 people. companies. Today we today. find out that ch ch more than more than two million people. And we also learned today that China has indeed cracked down on North Korea. Trade with North Korea has dropped by 50 percent. North Korea is feeling the squeeze. Look, Donald Trump has so many accomplishments that he has made that would not have been done without him being the president. But sometimes he makes himself too hot to handle. And he changes the subject from the good news and the accomplishments mm. to the controversies over his own behavior. And when you're doing that well and you have that many accomplishments, don't you want people to be talking about your accomplishments?
before I let you go, where I thought you were going with Nancy Pelosi wasn't where you went. I, I thought you were going to go with a comment about the five white guys trying to figure out immigration law. She actually said that, which, by the way, doesn't elevate the conversation. It, it had nothing to do with the, the remarks by the president. She said that at a public event, uh, thinking that that was okay. Yeah, I, I think that's another issue where Nancy Pelosi has shown just how out of touch she is. She doesn't well, see people Denny for their Warrior ideas first. She sees it. people for the color of their skin first. Um, but, you know, racial politics never works when Republicans talk about it. The press always turns against Republicans on those issues. They'll take Nancy Pelosi's side on that. Ari Fleischer, thank you very much. Great to see you and to get your professional perspective on this. Very helpful. Thank you. President Trump is also making headlines for his Wall Street Journal interview, where he described his relationship with North Korea's dictator. You just heard Ari talking about North Korea. Uh, he slams the FBI agent caught texting about him and explains how Mexico could pay for the border wall. We have one of those reporters who was in the room, interviewed him. Next, stay close. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. President Trump making headlines today for his interview with The Wall Street Journal. During that sit-down, the president said he and North Korea leader Kim Jong-un probably have a very good relationship. The president suggested perhaps they may have even spoken. He also weighed in on potential bias at the FBI, saying text messages between officials involved in the special counsel's Russia investigation amounted to treason. And he insisted Mexico could pay for the border wall indirectly through NAFTA renegotiations. One of the reporters who interviewed the president is with me now, Luis Rednovsky, White House reporter for The Wall Street Journal. So, Luis, he hit a lot of important news points yesterday. Talk to me. Well, we did cover a lot of ground. Perhaps the top line for many people was the revelation from the president that he believes he has a very good relationship with Kim Jong-un, that he was happy to suspend military exercises on the Korean Peninsula until after the Olympic Games was uh, completed, saying it would be inappropriate to have carried them out. He didn't say whether the two men had been in contact, but he left open the possibility that they had been. And when we asked him, you know, whether the text messages, sorry, the, the Twitter messages in which he's traded tough talk with the North Korean leader suggested that perhaps they didn't have a very good relationship. He said, well, I'm flexible. Uh, and that in many ways, his relationships with 20 or 30 examples of people reflected that he could be best friends with somebody that he'd be having very tough talk with only a few days earlier. Sure. No, and it's an important point, too, because with the South and the North meeting recently and saying that there could be future talks, there has been kind of this hanging question mark about how involved we might get in terms of even sitting down and talking. So the president getting on the record about a relationship potentially being more positive than one would think from the tweets that they both have sent out is news. Certainly. We also asked the president if he felt in any way boxed out or as if South Korea was trying to drive a wedge or North Korea was trying to drive a wedge that would cut the U.S. out of the talks. And the, the president was very clear he did not see that being the case. He said if anyone was a master of wedging uh, in situations, it was him uh, and that he believed that he would be playing a very valuable role going forward in this. But certainly that right now the relationship is very good. Uh, and we want to remind everybody because I'm sure they can hear the sirens near you. It is live television. And obviously you're standing outside the White House. So we're going to hear what's going on around you. Uh, the president also weighed in on the potential bias at the FBI. What did he tell you? He did. This came up somewhat unprompted, but he was, uh, we, were, we were asking about the Russia investigation, and he had some quite significant complaints about one of the FBI agents who had at some point been involved in the investigation, although he was later let go by, by special counsel Robert Mueller, because of text messages uh, in which he had referred to the potential of an investigation against uh, President Trump being used as an insurance policy in some way to, to guarantee the outcome of the election. Now, this is Mr. Trump's interpretation of the tweets, of course, but uh, the text messages, I apologize. But uh, he uh, felt that they amounted to treason and signaled that he interpreted that as part of this, this investigation being a broader witch hunt against him. You know, when you mention the word treason and the, the book that came out, uh, Fire and Fury, last week, and Steve Bannon, his former White House chief strategist, uh, whom he fired, the president did, uh, being quoted so heavily in that book and now lawyered up and getting ready to talk to House Intel. Did he talk at all about Steve Bannon in this? And, and did you ask him about him? 
he he did and we did uh, the full transcript is on WSJ.com and there's plenty of news in there for people who want to read it in full what they will see is that he was very angry about uh, what had happened with Steve Bannon, but also that there again he explained that there was a certain amount of flexibility, that he didn't know what the word permanent meant in reference to whether his break with Steve Bannon was indeed permanent. Really? Okay. Really. That, that, that's interesting. That um, came amid some very tough talk in which he said that Steve Bannon did not necessarily play a key role in his election victory, sure. but again, that there was, there was room for a possible uh, coming together again. Oh, that's very interesting because you know what Steve Bannon did. He threw some fuel on the fire this week and said the president is going to need him again in the future. Uh, so when you talk about even a little bit of daylight, a crack in the door, the window, whatever, with the president, that's news as well. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, just to hit those points that are new with your interview. And you said the full transcript is at WSJ. Uh, dot com so people can read about it but I want to just kind of get the texture uh, from the president when you ask about paying for the wall and how Mexico might actually play an indirect role right he said that there are many ways to get Mexico to pay for the wall we asked for an example and he said one was through NAFTA negotiations that essentially if a hard deal was won in NAFTA negotiations and he said that if a hard deal that was favorable to the United States wasn't won he was willing to walk away from the agreement altogether but if a hard deal was won and Mexico ended up paying the United States in some way he could divert that money use it for the wall and essentially say that as a result indirectly Mexico was paying for this now he also said that he didn't believe that the wall and he said this before a little bit didn't have to be 2100 miles long the entire length of the border the, the wall probably needed to be relatively small physically because of other natural barriers that he saw in the region and that was also in response to a question about how much money it would take to actually build the wall as part of the DACA deal uh, that's still being hammered out yeah okay so the senators handed the president yesterday which is where uh, the reporting is that the his uh, incendiary remarks were made because he was angry about what he saw before him. Uh, the Senate bill and this immigration bill really didn't have much cash for the wall. It fell a lot of dollars short. So I'm curious, the timing of your interview, was it already known that the Senate immigration bill was falling short and that dollars would be needed? We asked about the Senate bill, uh, the Senate deal. He said that at the time he was meeting with us, he hadn't seen it yet, but okay. he was very clear about what he wanted to see from it. He was very much in support of a permanent fix on DACA. He said that he had a lot of heart for uh, the 800,000 DACA beneficiaries, that he believed that they were hard working and that the country needed workers. That was something of a surprise uh, to some people, and that he believed his base was behind him in securing such a permanent fix. What he wanted in return was an end to the visa lottery, very explicit about that. That, and sure. some reduction in family-based immigration as well. He had some harsh words to say about that, too. Well, and we have heard so much in detail now about what's in it and his response as well. Uh, Louise Rednovsky with The Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much. We appreciate Thank you, you sharing, opening up your reporter's notebook to tell us what was in it. Thank you. Of course. Uh, we will know shortly if President Trump will reimpose sanctions against Iran. The president also faces another deadline on whether to recertify the Iran nuclear deal. Could he be laying the groundwork to withdraw completely from that agreement? And what would be the fallout of that? We'll break it down, the pros, the cons, with Israel's former ambassador to the United Nations. Stay close. And is, it is official, a Fox News alert now, a big announcement from the Trump administration on Iran. The State Department just announced the United States will continue to waive the sanctions on Iran, including the nuclear deal, as the administration plots its next moves. However, the U.S. is also issuing new sanctions on some non-nuclear entities that won't affect the overall agreement that is in place. Rich Edson is live at the State Department. So we knew some of this is coming. Break it down for us, Rich. Right, and an entire new announcement on top of that, Harris. The U.S. is going to stay in the Iran nuclear deal for now, according to White House senior administration officials. But the president says this is the last time he's going to certify, waive these sanctions against Iran, unless European governments agree to make changes to the Iran nuclear deal. So this puts the Iran nuclear deal on a clock that takes us to about maybe May or June, because the president has to certify these every 100 or 120, 180 days. 
Now there will have to be negotiations in order to keep the United States in the Iran nuclear agreement. On top of that, the United States, separate from the Iran nuclear agreement, is going to certify more than a dozen senior Iranian entities for an entirely different group of behavior. This is according to Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary. He says, quote, we are targeting the Iranian regime, including the head of Iran's judiciary, for its appalling mistreatment of its citizens, including those imprisoned solely for exercising their right to freedom of peaceful assembly and for censoring its own people as they stand up in protest against their government. Senior administration officials say they want to see from the European governments and from Congress, they want to demand that Iran allow immediate inspections, anytime, anywhere inspections, has to ensure that Iran won't come anywhere near a nuclear weapon, no sunset clause, so this uh, agreement would stay in place in perpetuity, uh, and they're now targeting the top of the regime with these different sanctions. European governments have said they like the deal as is, they want to keep this intact. The Trump administration is saying this is the last time we're going to waive these sanctions and stay in the deal. You guys have to agree to change uh, a different agreement here, change your approach to Iran, or we're out. Well, wow, that, that is actually a, a big deal because yes. in, in terms of trying to get those countries to come on board and make some changes, May is right around the corner. What are the changes specifically, maybe one or two, that you know of that he's expecting these European nations to do? Yeah, to this May. would be a separate agreement according to senior administration officials, a follow-on deal just to be negotiated with the European countries. That's the EU, uh, Britain, Germany, and France. And what they're looking to do is this deal sunsets after several years. They want to, the Trump administration wants to make sure that this agreement lasts, that Iran has to submit to these inspections and uh, do all that they're supposed to do under the Iran nuclear agreement beyond that decade-long sunset clause. Uh, they also want to uh, increase uh, certain uh, aspects to the agreement that allow the United States and, and international body really uh, to look and make sure uh, and inspect Iran to make sure that they're not producing yeah. nuclear weapons. It will be interesting to see if they can toughen those inspections because part of the criticism has been uh, those inspections are not really very open. They're not transparent. We need more mm. in that. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your reporting. Let's go now to my next guest, Dan Gillerman, former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and Fox News contributor. Ambassador, as you're hearing this, this is different. This president is walking out a completely different line now with Iran. Last time he's going to recertify, get it together, European nations. Your thoughts? Well, Harris, I think this is very good news. I really do. And I think this is just another example of this president saying America first. And in this case, America is the first to recognize and to unveil the mask which this evil, vicious Iranian regime is wearing and actually try and get the other signatories to this very bad agreement, Britain, France, Germany, China and Russia, to realize that this agreement must be amended, must be strengthened. Otherwise, the United States would walk away from it, and I think in that case, the agreement won't be worth very much. So I think this is a very bold step. I think it is also a step which is signaling to Iran that the United States is saying enough is enough. It is also addressing Iran's terror regime. Iran is the main harborer, perpetrator, financer, and executor of terror around the world. It spread its bloody tentacles in the form of its proxies. Hamas and Hezbollah in our region, but all over the world. And, you know, I think everybody realizes that, you know, this terror regime, which is already killing people and terrorizing them all over the world, what they're doing now is just a preview, soon to be seen in a theater near you if this country becomes nuclear. So I think what the president has announced today is very good news. And as I said, it's America first. I hope others will follow. You know, it's so interesting to, to hear you put it that way, because when many it's talked about, many people will say America first means putting our policies and, and things that sort of uh, feed into our vision of the world, our foreign policy. But what you're saying is America first in terms of leading, stepping out and saying, we're going to walk away from this deal. You've got till May or so to get it together to those countries, uh, the EU, Germany, Britain and France, uh, to, with a follow on deal with certain things as, as far as inspections and, and so forth. That's really, uh, and 
interesting and different take on America First that I hear you saying uh, about this. You know, this mentions the protesters, and I want to get your thought on the people on the street, not the government of Iran, but the protesters and how they play a role in this. Oh, I think we lost him. And it is, it is a tough thing, too, because you know we've had a little bit of a delay, right, so, so we're I working just... on that. But I think we've got you back. Ambassador? No, I... No, we don't. Yes. Hi, right, Harris. Can, no, I can... didn't realize. I heard... Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm, no, I'm, I'm with you. I just heard the program, and I thought you were showing something I had to react to. I'm sorry. But, you know, when we talk about the Iranian people, mm -hmm. it is actually a very, very interesting thing because Iran is a very young country. Fifty percent of Iranians were born long after the Shah. Half of Iran is under 20 years old. Sixty percent of all university students in Iran are women. It is an intelligent and very clever country. And I think that most of the people in Iran, as we've seen in the demonstrations just recently, are fed up with the ayatollahs and the mullahs. They are fed up with this dictatorship and autocratic regime. And I think Iran is ripe for a grassroots revolution. The only problem is we have two clocks ticking. We have the Iranian people's clock and we have the nuclear clock. And if Iran becomes nuclear before the people overthrow this evil regime, then we're all going to live in a horrible, horrible world. And as I said before, when I say America first, I know America first means looking after America's interests, being especially economic, but also in other fields. But I think in this case, what I meant when I said America first is America taking the lead. Right. America being the first one to call a spade a spade. And America saying to its other partners, come along with us, let's make this a better deal. Otherwise, we're going to walk away from it. And, and I think that's a very, very important warning. Ambassador Dan Gillerman, you have been along my side for some of the uh, big breaking news that affects your nation, ours, and the rest of the world. I appreciate your perspective on this. Thank you. Well, the big controversy over exactly what the president said in that private meeting on immigration, we're asking how this might play with his base and the rest of the American people. Our power panel, next. Fox Top Story, uh, the war of words rocking Washington. Let's bring in our power panel now. Michael Tobman served as a senior aide to Democratic leader, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer. And back from outnumbered, Fox News contributor Rachel Campos Duffy. So I, I want to go to you first, Rachel, just in terms of how this plays with the base. So I think that, uh, first of all, sometimes it's really good to be an unfiltered non-politician. And in this case, some bad things can happen when you're an unfiltered non-politician. And this is one of them. I think his base is going to forgive him. They, they, they voted for somebody who's impolitic. Um, I personally, I'm a minority. I don't think the president is a racist. I think the president is just unfiltered, says things in ways that, are, that most politicians would never say. them. And frankly, my interpretation of what he said was that he thought those countries um, and their governments were crappy, for lack of a, I don't want to use that word that they use. You don't want to use that word. I don't want to use that word and not the people. And I also think he was trying to make a statement about America um, selecting immigrants to meet our skills and our needs um, in the country. And, and, and maybe in his opinion, he thought that they shouldn't. Um, it picks from some of those countries. That said, can I just say one last thing? Yes. Mia Love, uh, first Republican female Haitian American. Her parents came here, never got a dime from the government, raised a fine young woman who is now a congresswoman um, in, 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 in the House of Representatives. Um, clearly, the kind of immigrants we do want. Well, and she's speaking out against the remarks by the president. Of course You know, the, the challenging thing for the White House, Michael, is that this feeds into the narrative uh, that Democrats have been, you know, looking at all along, kind of stoking all along mm -hmm. as the president makes remarks. You have a very generous heart. I wouldn't have been quite as, as forgiving on this. Um, look, I, 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 as usual, fall somewhere in the middle on this. I don't know that vulgarity and, and sort of harsh and hateful language 
uh, plays to any base, but the ideas behind it and his view of the world, um, I think is hurtful, and I, don't, I, I, I hope people don't respond to it. All of that being said, um, yes, the president is a non-politician and is a candidate and in, in first year in his administration. Uh, he certainly proved again and again he has the temperament to be unfiltered that way. I just wish, forget that it's something that shouldn't have been said, and let's assume it was said. It's something he shouldn't have been thinking, because it reveals also, a view of the world that I think uh, isn't I agree, healthy. and I would never speak that way myself. But isn't it fair for the president of the United States to assume he's in a private meeting? Uh, again, not anything I would say, right. but in this case, I look at what Dick Durbin, and I am assuming it's probably Dick Durbin who, who, who released that. I saw the interview with him. In my, when I look at that, I go, Dick Durbin cares more about politics and taking down our president, and by that I mean our, he is our president and the prestige of this country. Um, he, he, he cares more about taking him down than he cares about the prestige of this country and about our allies' feelings being hurt. Right, I want to give I want to give Michael a chance to respond to this because this was a private meeting, and and you take something that the president says or anybody in that room mm -hmm. outside of the context, and it becomes political. Of course, why do this as Democrats? I think if you, as I've said, if you want, if three people want to keep a secret, two of them have to be dead. It just simply doesn't, Ooh. it doesn't happen. You don't it, think that it's possible for I don't to think it's private. possible, but the easiest way to avoid this controversy is don't say it. There are other ways to say it. Don't say what you said. And then what people leak is we're having problems with our neighbors in the hemisphere. There's extreme poverty. If you don't say it, it's, it's. Well, what about I, not I, of always course being so people, offended? Of course people. When, when I, Joe Biden said that Obama example. was the first clean African-American presidential candidate, I, Obama said, I'm not offended, um, but he said those comments are historically I, inaccurate. I think we should stay focused on the immediate issue in front of us. Of course, you want to stay focused on that, um, but when you excuse when, when a I'm Democrat not says I, it. I'm not excusing anything. What I'm saying is the easiest way to avoid this and not have it leak Agreed. is don't say it. But well, to say not leak says, is you know, to maybe say... They should, not maybe it. they should have it recorded in the future, that 55-minute long immigration meeting that we right. as a nation got to see that was amazing and epic. So Maybe that's how it should be. So People can sometimes dial up different angels. They're better angels, I guess, when the cameras are on. So 100%. for the president to say that, he understands the nature of a private meeting. I'm just asking if Democrats understood the nature of a private meeting. We'll move on, but yes, just stay right where you are, because right. we're going to talk more. The top Democrat on the House Intel Committee reportedly is calling for dozens of additional witnesses in the ongoing Russia investigation. Steve Bannon, Corey Lewandowski, are ready, set to testify with Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump on the wish list. Are Democrats overreaching? Stay close. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Perino. There is growing dissension among the seven lawmakers who were in the room with the president when he reportedly made that disparaging comment. I can't even say on the air. What effect does this latest firestorm have on independence? We'll discuss. Plus, from Mexico to Michigan, what one company is doing to bring jobs to the Detroit area. All that and my weekend reading folder on the Daily Briefing. President Trump's former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, and former chief strategist Steve Bannon are set to appear before the House Intelligence Committee in a few days. Democrats say they want to know about comments he made in the White House tell-all book about Donald Trump Jr.'s 2016 meeting with a Russian attorney at Trump Tower. Here's the panel's ranking member. We are interested in speaking with Mr. Bannon. It's my expectation that we will do so. Uh, we'll be able to ask him the basis of those comments. Uh, as well as uh, the basis of his concern over money laundering uh, and, uh, and why this meeting in Trump Tower uh, represented, in his view, treason and certainly uh, unpatriotic uh, at a minimum. So we'll be looking forward to having Mr. Bannon before our committee and asking him those questions. Congressman Adam Schiff, Democrat, also reportedly wants to hear from dozens of additional witnesses, including Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner. We're back with the panel. Michael Tobman, Rachel Campos Duffy. You know, I do think it's interesting, uh, Rachel, that Lewandowski doesn't want to plead the fifth. He said, I'm going to answer all the questions. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of transparency that you know you can take to the bank. I mean, he's like, go ahead, ask me. I have nothing to do with Russians. And frankly, I look at this, this has been over a year because this was being investigated even before uh, President Obama got out of office. Uh, and there's been lots of leaks. Uh, and there's been lots of investigation, and there's been millions of dollars spent, and I have yet to see anything. I mean, even there were two indictments, and they really had nothing to do with Russia collusion. So I say I'm all about, you know, it's obvious Adam Schiff wants to keep going with this. Um, he's built his entire career out of this Russia um, probe, and he doesn't want it to end. Um, but, you know, if they want to go and look, fine. 
But let's look on the other side too, because there's, I think, more of a case for Russia collusion with the Clinton, with the Clinton Foundation and pay for play and Uranium One and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff to look at there. Michael? On the Clinton Foundation piece, yes, um, that was unseemly. It was inappropriate, and the voters made their decision on that in November 2016. So other than losing the highest office in the land, I think we could probably put that one to the side. But on the immediate issue, um, it could be because I'm an attorney as well, um, that these investigations are supposed to bring in as many people as possible. And I agree, if people don't want to take the fifth and they don't want immunity deals, great, come in and tell us everything you know, whether it's uh, um, family. And again, the president opened the door to this by having his daughter and son-in-law become advisors and have a, an official position or quasi-official position in the administration if they were private citizens still in New York. But it's supposed to be sprawling. It's supposed to be contentious. It's supposed to be expensive also. A and it's, and it's supposed to be fair because what we see is the investigation of Trump. It is fair. The House, not, the House oh, majority on. is Republican. I, I want to step in here, though, because I, I, I oh, want to bring on. up Steve Bannon. I, I don't know if you guys were watching earlier, but the Wall Street Journal White House reporter who was on with me, Louise Rednovsky, was saying uh, in her interview, her sit down just with the president this week, he kind of left the window open, left a crack in the door open for Steve Bannon. There might be room for a little, you know, coming back together. Mm -hmm. But this is the comment that the author attributed to Steve Bannon in that tell all. Even